Hey everyone, we're super excited to present the AI Native Database podcast series. We've invited some incredible people to discuss where these new advances in generative AI are taking us and the role that database systems will play in it. This series contains four interviews with Andy Pavlo, Paul Groth, John Maida, and Dan Shipper. All four podcasts feature WeVA co-founder and CEO, Bob Van Light. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoy the series. Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching the WeVA podcast. I'm super excited to present our special mini series featuring WeVA CEO Bob Van Light and Professor Paul Groth from the University of Amsterdam. This series is exploring all sorts of new topics about the future of databases and what it means to be an AI native database. Paul and Bob, thank you both so much for joining the podcast. Yeah, great to be here again, Connor, and thanks for joining, Paul. Yeah, thanks. To, it's nice to be here. Fantastic. So the idea is that we had this conversation, so um, Connor and I, where we said like, there's so much happening in the space and everybody is so excited about what's what's happening that we wanted to invite a couple of people to have these conversations with of like where they think we're like at the forefront of what's happening, where they think that things might be going and where things might be leading. And I had a conversation with, um, uh, with, with Paul during an event uh, in Amsterdam and he had some very interesting ideas. So that's basically the concept. We're going to record a couple of these things and these conversations. So um, it's a bit experimental, but we look very much forward to, um, you know, um, start the conversation of where everything is going with the models, with the uh, with the infrastructure side, the whole AI native stack, if you will. So that is the um, that is the concept of what we're what we're doing here. So, so Paul, maybe you can share a little bit what you're working on today, what you are, what you're doing, what you're working on, and then we can lead into your ideas about how things might be evolving. Yeah. So, uh, thanks for having me. First of all, um, yeah, we're working really on this kind of connection between. I think of it as how do we build great data sets, and that idea of building great data sets really has evolved around this connection between knowledge graphs and now with language models. And how do those two connect, right? And obviously they do through things like vector database search, but I think this is where we've been doing a lot of work using language models as encoders for parts of knowledge graphs or using um, uh, language models to help us complete knowledge graphs or answer queries over knowledge graphs, those kinds of things. But I think the thing that really got us going when we were talking, right, Bob, we were, we were having this chat and I was like, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about a lot, and maybe this is the controversial idea, is do we need any databases at all? Yes. So I'm a data management guy, right? So I think databases are great, right? And I think, you know, having structured data, you know, I did a, I've done a lot of work there. How do we do data integration, building these things? And so these LLMs are really have made me start thinking and, and questioning, you know, what is the role of a database in these systems? Do we need databases? And, and so that I think you really uh, latched onto that and wanted to have a yes. chat about that. Yes, that was I was that that was a super interesting thought and like also thought provoking, of course. And I think what's there are two things that i would love to double click on so the first thing is the um the when we talk about knowledge graph right so the um we had this 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 knowledge graph that sits in the in the in the in the domain of like the um uh, 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 of the semantic web right where we have ontologies definitions and those kind of things so m my first question is before we go to the uh, uh to to the concept of like trying to answer the question do we need a database or what does that stack look like can you can you first share with us what a what a, is, is the did the definition of a knowledge graph change because of llms or is it still the same thing and if it's still the same thing or if it has changed how do you define what a knowledge graph is today yeah so i think really when people talk about knowledge graphs what they're talking about are graph structured databases right and uh, there's many different, you know, you have entities, relationships between those entities. The kind of canonical thing that Google introduced kind of introduced the name of knowledge graphs. And I think there's a lot of different technology stacks, right, that you can implement a knowledge graph in, whether it's a completely graph database, implement it. You can implement a knowledge graph, from my perspective, in a standard relational database. 
you can use the semantic web stack, you can you could implement it in Python. But really, you're talking about how do we create structured databases where the entities and their entities and relationships between them, and you know that the entities are somehow unique, right? So this is yeah. what I think of when I think of knowledge graphs. And in terms of, you know, where language models have really come in, I think there's two kind of perspectives that have been. So uh, one is what I would call language models for knowledge graphs. Right. So this yes. is how do we use an LLM to help us construct a, a, a knowledge graph? And we do a lot of research on how, you know, we can make information extraction a lot cheaper. Uh, we don't have to do as much uh, annotation, maybe that kind of thing. We've also done some work where you can think of, yeah, we have in a knowledge graph, you have attributes, right? And in a lot of databases, you may have text in a in a column, right, or an attribute of an entity, you may have an image, you may have uh, even a, you know, a protein sequence. And then you can use a LLM to start getting information out of those kinds of attributes. So that's another kind of language model for knowledge graph. And I think that's where we're kind of out now, right? Hey, we want to build a database. Hey, we want to build a knowledge graph. Yet to use an LLM. Hey, we have a knowledge graph. Can we use that LLM to help us answer, uh, you know, questions over it, or help us do better link prediction over the top of that? That kind of thing. So, so and that's where we're kind of. At. Yeah. So, would it be fair to say if we say the um, um, so basically what what you're saying, if I if I echo this back correctly, is that you're saying like it doesn't really matter how you implement. The knowledge graph there's like many many ways to do that one way to do that is inside the llm so for example if we have um uh, a, you know a connor connor works at weaviate right we can make that as an implicit link in 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 vector space for example well i think or, i think that's a little that's the second thing so i think there's when we talk right now we have llms for creating knowledge graphs Mm -hmm. where the knowledge graph really uh canonically looking at a database you know there's an entity you can write a graph query over it that kind of thing and then there is a language model as a knowledge graph right and okay. i think that is also something that's a direction we have and so those are kind of the two categories i would put things in and i think both are super interesting to explore and yeah, no, probably the, the latter Go ahead, Bob. Yeah, but Sorry. before we go to the latter, I just want to make sure because I find this super interesting, right? So, because one of the things that I've, especially also when we started with Weaviate, so um, um, we were also thinking about this in the concept of knowledge graphs, right? So before the term, you know, vector database was used. And conceptually, the idea was like that there was an implicit relation between two data objects if they were just closer together in vector space, right? That was the, yeah, that was the implicit relation and i think that might be conceptually for the people listening interesting if we go to the next part of this um uh, of this conversation is that we say that we that that inside the model if you will sits those implicit knowledge graph relations are in there just by being if we represent the the information in a, in a factor embedding that they just simply sit closer together yeah, and I think what people have done a lot, and, you know, we've had to work on that, and it's a big, you know, research area, and, and people do it, is this idea of what's called link prediction, or even entity resolution. And a classic way to do that is you get your entities, you put them in a vector database, and you compute the similarity, and then you could say, hey, actually, those two are the same, or that there's likely a link there. And you know, actually using an LLM to create those representations can help you. We have some kind of really nice work on actually that, right? So getting better representations of your entities, and then you can put it in a vector database and you can calculate the, the similarity or calculate new links. But then what do you do, right? And then do you leave it in the data, leave it in the vector database, or do you kind of reify it and make it a graph again, right? Yeah, and I think a lot of what we've done is say, okay, we'll use the tool of a vector database. We'll use a tool of link prediction to make a graph again. Right? Like we'll put mm. in the graph, 
do some stuff, add some stuff back to our graph, generate the graph, and we have a nice graph database again. And you could view that as, okay, we have some text, we put it through an information extractor, we get some information on the text, we put it back into our database, our graph, our knowledge graph again, and we keep building up our knowledge graph. And that's kind of the view. And I think it's a pretty strong view that a lot of people adopt. Now there's this secondary view is, hey, let's put everything in a vector database or even more boldly, just leave everything in the parameters of our model, right? And that's a view that is is super interesting. You get a lot of power from that, but there's also some, that's a, a maybe a direction you want to talk about a bit more. Exactly, because that is something that I'm that I'm super interested in, right? So if we look, for example, um, when I was introduced to um, uh, uh, to Rag, right? So uh, retrieval augmented generation. Um, somebody pointed me to a um, there's like this folder in the in the uh, the Transformers um, uh, on, on GitHub. There's like a folder in the Transformers library that is literally called Rag. And uh, what you see in there is that the um, uh, what they try to do, they have these two models. <clears throat> so these two uh, DPR models. And what they basically do is that the model, yeah, for lack of better definition, knows that it needs to do a retrieval from a from a vector store. And in this uh, in this example that you can find, I, I'm going to assume it's still in there. And if it's not, you can just find it in, in the, of course, in the Git history. Um, it, it uses a face and it does then that it retrieves that from face and it um, uh, and it's used in generating the, the the tokens for for an answer and what is of course very very interesting in that and kind of different than how we today the term rag is used is what I what I personally use is that I use two definitions I I use one I use um, a more primitive rag and and novel rag. And primitive rag is just shooting something from the from the vector database in the prompt, right? So that is what we see the most right now. We we have that too in which, but that's what I want to park. I want to talk more about this this novel approach, right? So where basically the model against, for lack of better terminology, knows that it needs to do a retrieval from, in this case, the store. And if I understand you correctly, is that you're basically saying that even that step is an abstraction that we might be able to remove in the model, right? Is yeah, that, is and that I think this is where, yeah, this is exactly. So I think you have canonically, right? So people doing, I guess, technically would be few shot prompting, right? Mm -hmm. Or if you had rag, you would get some examples from your vector database, you put it in the, you know, you put it in your prompt and then you would prompt the language model to do some downstream task, right? Or you could have uh, models in which the, you know, the, the model you train the model to actually run queries against whatever underlying database mm -hmm. i'm kind of really going one step further or not one step further i'm coming to coming back to this idea that uh one of the cool things about these very large language models is that you have data already in the parameters of the model so here i want to reference a, a really for me a game-changing paper is this work mm -hmm. called from patroni uh, uh, and in the senior author, and that was Sebastian Riddell, called Language Models as Knowledge Bases. Mm. So, cited thousands of times, really a, a fantastic paper, and it was in 2019. And this idea that, you know, actually all the data is already in your parameters, right? Do you need to go out to uh, other places, right? And now, that's the that's the question I have, right? So, and and as the models get more performant, do we just leave all the data in our parameters of our LLM, and that's it, right? And or how do we think about that in terms of new architectures for systems? But this is where yeah. I'm I'm going. Yeah. So so let's double click on that, right? So the the um, one of the one of the things that I'm intrigued by is the fact that the um that that the models are stateless right so basically we we take a snapshot in time 
Um, um, so we, you know, we take we take a data set, data set X, train the model, and then this is like a snapshot in time, right? So the um, um, this is for for you know if you if you play around with these generative models like like ChatGPT, right? That it says like I'm trained in 2021. I don't know the answer, right? Or I don't have access to this information because that was in the original uh, 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 in the original train set. So what we try to achieve here is statefulness, right? So that we can say we can change the state. So um, uh, in database terms, basically we would say we want to add CRUD support to the model, right? So we want to create something in the model. We want to be able to retrieve it or read it and update or delete it in the in the model. And what I'm what I, what I find interesting is that if we <clears throat> if we talk about um, the, the the process of creation, so the the C in CRUD, then <clears throat> that might be a form of um, or this 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 what what people are doing with with this novel rag approach, or if we're saying we uh, we don't do that, but we do that more in the model, then it would be like a, a form of fine tuning, I guess. If that's done, we have the second one, so the the of the, the the reading, so we can read it, we can retrieve it because it's now captured in the in the weights. But I'm not sure how we can um, update and delete data yet, right? So. Let's say that we fine tune the model on new knowledge. How do we how do we give it that that those two other um, uh, uh, functions? How do we update the knowledge that the, the model has, or how do we even delete it? Yeah. So I think so. This is this is the kind of fundamental question that that I've I've been thinking about a lot of in these architectures. So I have a a large EU project called Explainable. Uh, machine learning over knowledge graphs, and and that's with a, a bunch of different partners. And there, we're trying to explore kind of these different, I guess I would call it representations of knowledge, right? So you have the representation that's in your database, or even in your vector database, right, of, of your knowledge. You have knowledge that you can, in some sense, have in the parameters of your uh, language model, and you could have knowledge in, I guess I would call it unstructured sources, for lack of a better term. Here I'm thinking text, I'm images or video, right? And now mm -hmm. the, the question I've been really thinking about is what is the architecture? Where do you leave your knowledge, right? Mm -hmm. So some of that knowledge is useful to have in the parameters of your LLM, but maybe, as you said, it's hard to update, mm -hmm. right? And we can talk about okay, we can do like adapter tuning. So things like LoRa to encode different knowledge, but maybe that's too expensive. But there's this cost actually of even getting something into your database, right? So there's this information extraction, but maybe we can do that information extraction completely on the fly. And so that's the question that I've been really playing around with is like, where do I keep my knowledge, right? What's the best? Do we have any ideas about where, you know, do I keep it all in natural language and let the LLM process it for me on the fly? Do I actually, you know, put it in a database where I have some structure? I mean, even in a, in a, in a vector database, you have some structures, right? Yeah. I think in Weaviate, you guys do these nice little JSON structures, right? That you can push in into the, the vector database. So that's pretty cool. Or do you like say, look, actually we put it, everything's in the parameters in the model. And so that I think, I think a lot of people, or I think there's a, that's the thing we're gonna be playing around with in the future, right? So where do I keep my knowledge, right? Yeah, so if we if we assume that for the foreseeable future, because that is also something we, we could debate, but then, uh, you know, at, at the risk of getting too abstract, let's assume that for the foreseeable future, that the that the the, the core architecture of the LLM stays transformer based, right? What is the and let's say we solve the read, uh, sorry, the update and delete uh, problem, right? So let's assume, for the sake of argument, it's a solve. It's a solve. We can create, read, update, delete. Um, then still we we are dealing with the with the hallucination problem, right? So that um, if we so and that kind of is related, is I, if I understand it correctly, with the thing you previously said that if we add something to the model, we need to make sure that whatever you know knowledge we gave it, that it will reproduce the tokens exactly in that order as we stored them, right? 
Yeah, I, I mean, I think there is. Um, I think the question is, what are we worried about with hallucination? And what we're really worried about is that we're going to get, you know, on factual things, right? We're worried mm -hmm. about things that are incorrect coming from from the model. And now the question is, what's the best way to address it? And right now, I think one of the better ways to address this is these rag style models, right? Mm -hmm. So you're using the LLM's language capabilities, but you're saying, look, you have to do it on these trustworthy sorts of documents. I can control what you're doing. There might be other ideas about how we can control the hallucination process, right? Or to control hallucination is what I mean. Um, where you're, where you're not, where you're not looking at controlling the inputs to the model. Uh, um, where I think is really interesting is what do you want to use a database for? Um, and in the sense that I think with a transformer based model, it's going to be very hard to control exactly the facts you're using. Right. Mm. And I think that's, that's something like. Just think about it this way. You're talking about a, a customer relation management system, yeah. right? And you have your customers and you have, uh, you know, their contacts, their, you know, where they are on your sales pipeline, all those things. And there, I think you want control, right? And there you want to have precision. And that's the fundamental thing where, where we're going to just have to think about you know, where do you want precision in your whole system? And that's where databases are always good, right? That's why we do record keeping fundamentally. And the precision, we give up something when we use a LLM, and but we give it up for a reason, right? We give it up for the softness that it provides and the, the capabilities that provide. But I still think, you know, that I don't know yet how to precision control the knowledge in and you know, a transformer based LLM, right? That's the, okay. that's where I think I haven't figured, I mean, if you have a good idea about how to do that, <laughs> let me know. But I think that's where, because if we could precision control that, then we would be in a very different space. And maybe with in-context learning, we could push the model in the right direction, right? So making it, you know, prompt it to get to the right parameter space. But that precision control is like where you, we obviously have a set of technologies that mm. can back a CRM system, right? Yeah, and so it, can we? So it, I'm I'm interested in reversing the argument, right? So right. let's say that the answer to precision control is a database. So that we say basically currently these weights is just a, it's just a big binary blob, right? It's just you know, that's on disk and then it goes through it. What if there's a a way of storing those that information and these weights the other way around in a database? That the the the, the weights are stored basically and that we might have a um like um mm -hmm. I don't know, a git style tree representation or something that we say like okay, we know how it's changed. So um, um, uh, um we added something to the database. Let's stay let's stay with the example of the um, of the of the uh, like the the, the 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 CRM system, right? The that the um, we might tell the LLM customer X moved from the beginning of the pipeline to the middle of the pipeline, for example, and that we can actually that how the weights change based on that, rather than keeping that in the now fine-tuned blob, have a database that actually stores that information. That we can also say okay, that for whatever reason, if it's wrong, that we can, for example, reverse it, right? So that it's actually that the argument we, that we do need a dedicated database, but that we need to be become more sophisticated as vector database provider in what the database can do and that it interacts with and how it interacts with the model. We, because we kind of now assume, and maybe this is just the most optimal way of doing it. I'm just uh, this is the the idea of these these conversations, right? That we that is like that we can th start to think about these things. Maybe this is just having this binary blob of these weights is the optimal situation. But I was intrigued 
when I saw, for example, um, uh, these GitHub repos pop up like GPT for all, et cetera, where they started to port the weights to C++ to run, and, and then you could run them on GPU and on CPU, those kind of things. And I was like, I don't see that it, why it needs to stop there, right? So um, then actually you would need a specific database and rather than having a, a blob of, of uh, weights, you have a database with weights that gives you that. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's, as, I think absolutely, I, absolutely. I think one of the interesting things is just even in a more, a simple thing, right? Let's say you have a database running your, and let's say you have different LLMs. So this is something that we've done quite a lot is we have, for example, we just we just put a, a paper on archive um, called BioBLP, and I can give you the links later, but the cool thing about that is we use different LLMs as representation encoders, right? Mm. So here we use an LLM for protein sequences. We use another LLM that's designed for molecules, right? So it's trained on sequence of molecules. And then we use one that's designed that's a standard LLM for text, right, for diseases. And what we do is we use, we get representations of all of those different entities out. And we've got, they're encoded in a binary blob, right? Mm. And, you know, that's a perfect situation where, well, what do we, where do we put that stuff, mm. right? And we put that on files, right? And we do some stuff with PyTorch, da, 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 and load those files. But there is a place where actually having databases that are able to cope with those kinds of encoding approaches would be very nice. We have that a bit with vector databases, absolutely. But that kind of connection where you have a, you have a data set that's your kind of semi-structured data, you know exactly how those representations are connected. You ran, run them through multiple different kinds of LLMs and managing all that stuff. I mean, maybe, maybe I just don't know, but I feel like that's a place that, you know, having more systems to help us with that and to do that all super efficiently, right? I think for, from my view, that's a super interesting area or direction to go. Now, it's not as far out, right? But I think practically that's something that people are going to, I know we want it, right? And I think, you know, that means that the like, other folks are, are going to want it as well. This this is great. So so I think if we so if we want to want to get to like a conclusion of what we've what was discussed here is that the that that basically and ma please make sure to to correct me if I'm if I'm wrong but the that, that one way that we could say if we look at the where the LLMs right are right now or the multimodal models for that matter right we just can throw them on one pile just so the, the Let's call me just refer to them as the LLMs now, right? So you have the LLMs, <clears throat> and the 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 problem that we have is that we're saying that um, that the LLM has in combination with the database is that you get a vector representation out that you store, but that's like one directional, right? You can't go back. You can't go from the vector embedding back into the model and reproduce, you know, however the you know. Um, the weights were touched to get to that factor embedding. But if the database would evolve where we would say, no, no, we rather than having the binary blob of weights, we have a database representing all these weights. So the, the next gen, uh, uh, so that, that then, then the factor database evolves in a weights <laughs> database, I guess, might be, might be a way, a w way forward. Yeah. To and I so absolutely and i think what i one of the things you know i'm you know i'm an i'm an academic right and and one of the <laughs> things i like to do is look a little bit at history right that and one of the things we had in the i think is in the two, 2000s late 90s um there was a really in database architectures one of the trends that people started to look at was they called them text databases, but the idea was, is we, if we have specialized data types, could we do inside our database, 
managing those special data data types, doing special things, for example, doing information extraction on on text, right? And that was a real architectural thinking back then. And I think now we might be in a really good place to do that. So what should our database look like when we're really able to effectively cope with data types that are not just relations, right? Or not just exactly. pure structure. And so that, you know, sometimes, you know, these older ideas, if they come back, they come back at a, at the right time, right? Because in the 90s, 2000s, we weren't in a place that we had these this capability to very easily work with unstructured data, but now we are at that place. So now we need data management systems that help everybody do that. Now, this is it, not as controversial as saying we don't need databases, but... Uh, no, 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 but it's like, so it's, it, it, was not my, it was not my intention per se to end this conversation as like uh, that I wanted to somehow, you know, flip the argument. But I, what I find super interesting, so one of the things that I, so you're an academic and I, I run a business, right? So we, the, um, that, that, that's, well, different, right? So, but one of the things that I like to say from that perspective is I call that the, about what's happening in what we like to call the AI native stack. So that includes the models and the vector database today is one of the things that I like to say is that if you if you look at the at the vector database, you can make a, um, a I like to call it the, the pessimistic argument and the optimistic argument for what they where they sit and what they bring to the to the data stack. And what I mean with that is that with the the the, the pessimistic argument is that it's just another NoSQL database, right? So every data type, you have these, these handful of general purpose databases, the Postgres, MySQL, et cetera, of this world. And then you have these dedicated um, uh, database around data types that often sit in the NoSQL layer, uh, graph databases, time series databases, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So what I like to call the pessimistic argument is that effective is, is just another NoSQL database. Mm -hmm. But the optimistic argument that I like to make, is that, and that is related to what you just said, Paul, is that, that I believe that the there's this paradigm shift happening on how we're interacting with our data and how we're storing it because of the the LLMs, right? So it's it's more yeah. Uh, and this is the this is the thing that I think is yeah. so exciting yeah. is that we're now able to deal with unstructured like. Unstructured yes. data can really become a peer to structured data. And many times we may not even want to structure our database. So think about your CRM. Exactly. We, we started with the CRM system. Maybe before, right, we had we had we have this emails back and forth with our contacts, right? And before, one of the things that you might do is you might go do this manual work of you know getting out the phone number of your contact getting out the you know their willingness to pay i don't know i'm not a i'm not a great sales guy but like uh like you get all this uh all this information and you put it in the fields of your crm system right but now yeah. maybe we don't have to do that and maybe we don't have to run a complicated information extraction pipeline we can just say actually our llm is able to do that and reify what we need on the fly and actually that's good because maybe the person updates their contact details right so we don't have to you know we don't have to synchronize and that's really the point synchronize our unstructured data which may be more up to date with our you know curated structured data now if i'm building a canonical database where actually i've implemented a you know a ui around it and i'm collecting data from a form that or an app or whatever then actually my structured data is natively structured i would mm. call it that way but a lot of data isn't natively structured so why structure it when you can quote unquote structure it on the fly and i think if you think about vector databases or i mean in some sense in in databases what happens is all relational databases consume all like now if you look at graph databases sql has a from last year has a 
you know, a graph query language in it, right? But it took many, many years to figure that, that that's fundamentally what we need. We need these graph people. There's enough consumers that need that or time series or whatever. But I think more the question is, if you're building a data management system, you really have to think about the idea that your unstructured data can be pretty peer and you're going to have a lot more of it because it's actually probably in many cases more up to date than doing the structuring process. And so that's the kind of data management architectures we're going to have to think about and build. Right. So. Exactly. And I, I, I have a quick anecdote to share because I, this was in the very, very, very early days of a uh, weave So this was before, you know, sentence embeddings and have you. So that was just, everything was still based on, um, on, on glove and fast text. And I, remember that I was at a, um, at a link data, I was presenting at a link data conference and, um, the, the, what I was showing that was like in really the early days of Weaviate, what I was showing was a lot of these debates that were happening at the link data conference was like, how are we going to make, well, the relations, right? So how do we agree on, on things, etc. And, um, the topic of my talk was like, what if we don't, what if we let the, the model uh, uh, the site, right? So, and back then, how that was done was that I, what I did was that I took a, a little paragraph of text, and the the example that I always used was the um, uh, um, uh, that I had like uh, the Eiffel Tower, and I had like Paris as data objects, and that the relations were made based on the fact where they sat in vector space, and then if they were close. A relation was made in the in the database. So what I showed to the audience there was that I was saying, like, why just not why why shouldn't we just stop doing all this and just let the models and again those were the early these early models let the models decide what the relations are. Well, I can tell you, and not everybody appreciated that idea because if you built like twenty years of your career on figuring out how to structure ontologies and those kind of things, <laughs> and then somebody comes, let a model do it, but. I really do think that's the paradigm shift that's happening. Yeah, and I think one of the actually things I I gave a a talk recently um, to uh, folks that work on knowledge organization systems. So these are really mm -hmm. canonical people who build things like library indexing structures. And one of the things I messaged that I sent to them is a lot of actually what I think is the the cap the things that canonical knowledge engineers do actually are even more important, not the building of the ontology. If you look again at very old literature, like 1990s stuff, right? Expert mm. system stuff. Mm -hmm. Funnily enough, a lot of those methodologies, there's a big chunk about building ontologies and structuring things and formalizing things and building formal. But a big chunk of that is actually talking to your customers understanding the organizational environment. So essentially what we would call now data product owners, product owners in general, user interfaces designers, those skills, actually we, with all of these LLMs, what we're doing is we can empower canonical knowledge engineers to go faster because the knowledge representation language now isn't an ontology, it's, you could almost view it as natural language, right? So yes. that's really, yes. so when we talk about prompt programming, right, what we're doing or managing prompting is in some sense, natural language has become our, um, you know, our knowledge representation formalism for lack of a better yes. term. Yes. But the point is, is that doesn't mean all of the things that you would teach somebody about talking to your stakeholders, understanding what they're doing, figuring out the system they're in, that all stuff applies. And you just have a, you know, much more powerful, as you call this AI native stack to build those kind of products, right? So it just makes everything yeah, I think it's a little bit easier now to be because you're not mucking around with formalism so much. And we have yes. a new I'll I'll spend I'll send you a uh, we have a, just a new kind of um, paper on archive about this. I'll send it into the Slack 
uh, called um, knowledge engineering using large language models. And this is one where we think about these two directions. So one is using. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. No, I just want to say I, I really want to want to emphasize how important this is because the um, um, uh, to try and want one more anecdote very early in my career. Um, when I um, uh, I was like you know early twenties and I was um, I was working on a I was hired by a, la a larger organization to help with like um that was an e commerce related data structure right and my ambition was to capture everything for that large organization in one big um, yeah a, a JSON object basically right so there's all these definitions from what we had as customers and the person the senior architect who hired me is like you can't do that. And I was like, of course I can. Look at this. And he was like, and he, he told me a, a little lesson. So he, he got me in touch with three people in the organization. And he said, just visit these people and define just your JSON object for customer. So I was like, sure. So I went to the first person, had a meeting, and a beautiful JSON object came out representing the customer. So I went to the second person. I said, like, this is how I'm going to represent the customer. And this person said, oh, yeah, but that's not how we look at, that's for us, not a customer. That is something else. So long story short, he told me a lesson in a day that just by talking to three people in this large organization, I was unable to, to capture the definition of customer in one JSON object. And the, what I mean with the paradigm shift now is that we are outsourcing that, as also what you said in, like, in, the, in the form of prompt engineering, to the model. They were basically saying like, hey, listen, this is our organization. This is the structure of our organization. This is how they look at customers. This is how that part of the organization looks at customers. Now do something with our customers, right? So whatever, whatever it is that you want to solve. And I think that that's the paradigm shift, right? That we outsource yeah, that I, to the models. Yeah, I mean, if you want a really far out thing, uh, we ran a hackathon in London this summer. We call it the Knowledge Prompting Hackathon. Yeah. And we had 40 PhD students. And we actually just said, okay, we want you to design, we want you to prompt like crazy. And we literally had, so for example, we were prompting these models to actually act as, uh, for example, um, user story creators. So it would literally... Yes. You could, we could prompt it so that the model would ask you and it would build up user stories for you, which was was super wild for me, you know, all the things that we're doing. Or, for example, another thing, you know, we having the model help you curate your underwriting knowledge. So having the model drive you to help make decisions on, for example, definitions that you want. Um, so I think that's really powerful. But that doesn't I mean, the other side of it is like actually. I think this is a, um, I think this is the powerful mechanism of when do you need structure and when you don't. And, but we can now drive this from the, from the needs of the business or the organization or the, the product. Yes. Yes. So this is, this is, this is, this is super exciting. And, um, Thank you so much for for sharing these these viewpoints, um, uh, uh, Paul. It, I think if we we want to recap all the lessons learned after we've we've did, done this this mini series, but I think that the the ideas of of this paradigm shift, um, um, getting the question answered, do we need a database in the future at all? Right, is super thought provoking and interesting, and if the answer is if the answer is no, then the question is, what does that look like, right? But and then, but if the question is like, yes, we do need it, but then it just it needs to evolve to capture really on a weight like basically have cross support on a weight level, right? So um, this is this has been super um, uh, helpful. And before we end, it's just just something I told you in person, but I want to also say this, I have this on record. That you've played a tremendous important you know important role for for me personally in the early days because it was early in my career when you were um introducing the models and like back then with glove and fast it was really a big eye-opener for me so um 
uh, indirectly you play a role in the fact that that there's now a, a vector database company. So thank you so much for sharing all that and for you know joining the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's uh, it's been really fun. Good luck with the series. <laughs> thank you.